to reach out to people they wouldn't normally collaborate with. Now, in this case, we fudged a little because Mike Ferris is a um, friend and has actually worked with the other artists, but he is white and his perspective and the black artist perspective, when they come together, they have produced an amazing visual art for us tonight. So I'm very, very, very excited. We have one more after tonight. Next Saturday night, we are presenting Jazz in June. We have an international jazz clarinetist, Doreen Ketchens, with a local master musician, John Windings. They'll be performing next Saturday night for our final um, performance of the Artist Collective. And then we hope to come back for one more quick session, just one hour. Terwitt has agreed to come back as well. Um, we had a few technical difficulties, but it was still a great show. All of the performances, all of the artists have given us permission to archive these um, presentations. So um, probably later part of July, you can see all of the presentations on um, the Legacy YouTube channel. All right, I also wanna introduce our program coordinator, Amiel in the wind beneath all of our wings with this particular project. We've put a lot of hard work in. With that being said, we want to reach our goal of building bridges. So we invited conversations to be facilitated by local thought leaders and influencers. And I could think of no other person to be with me tonight for this conversation other than my new friend, and then colleague Dr. Taylor is the newly inaugurated president of Shawnee Community College. He's a distinguished scholar. He's a man of action. I have the pleasure of serving on his advisory board. And I'm going to let you just let Dr. Mason give you a little bit uh, more about his background. And thank you again for being with us tonight. And then we'll move into the art show. Dr. Taylor. Good evening, thank you, Lynn. Uh, always a, a pleasure uh, working with you. Um, I want everyone to know I'm honored and appreciative of the opportunity to speak with you on this beautiful summer's eve. Again, my name is Dr. Tim Taylor and I am the president of Shawnee Community College. I hope your day so far has been, you know, well. I think you'll enjoy tonight's show. And as facilitator of this wonderful event, I was asked to present a few thoughts about art. So here we go. For centuries, you know, probably throughout time, people have used race, ethnicity, religion, and difference to distract us and keep us from becoming our true selves. Often, art in all of its forms finds ways to bridge those barriers and touch our souls and bring us into harmony. One of the great challenges today is that we feel often untouched by the problems of others and by social issues like race, equity, inclusion, and unity, even when we could easily do something to help. Sometimes it seems we do not feel strongly enough that we're part of a larger community, a part of a larger we. You know, giving people access to information, words, data, doesn't usually help. Most often these things leave people feeling overwhelmed and disconnected not empowered or poised for action. My friends, this is where art can make a difference. Art does not show people what to do, yet engaging with a good work of art can connect you to your senses, to your body and your mind. It can make the world felt and this felt feeling may spur thinking, engagement and even action. Most of us know the feeling of being moved by a work of art, whether it is a song, a play, a poem, a novel, a painting, or a spatial temporal experiment. When we are touched, we're moved. We're transported into a new place, something that's never before felt, strongly rooted in a physical experience in our bodies. 
we become aware of a feeling that may not be unfamiliar to us, but which we did not actively focus on before. This transformative experience is what I believe art is constantly seeking. I believe that one of the major responsibilities of artists, the idea that artists have responsibilities may come as a surprise to some, but it is to help people not only get to know and understand something with their minds, but also to feel it emotionally and physically. By doing this, art can mitigate the, number, the numbing effect created by the glut of information and disinformation that we are faced with today and motivate people to turn in their thinking into doing. I am convinced that by bringing us together to share and discuss, a work of art can make us more tolerant of difference and of each other. The encounter with art and with others over art can help us identify with one another, expand our notions of we, and show us that the individual engagement in this world actually has consequences. That's why I hope in the future, art will be invited to take part in discussions of social, political, economic, and ecological significance, even more than it currently is. And artists will be included when all leaders at all levels, from local to regional, consider solutions to the challenges that face us all in the world today. Again, thanks to the folks of the Chicago Community Trust, Legacy Training, Southern Illinois Community Foundation, and Healing Illinois for sp sponsoring this important conversation. Again, history has shown that art can bring people together, overcome biases in ways that build stronger communities. And given where we are in this world today, socially, I can't think of a better way to foster unity than through conversations like these. Thank you all for listening and on with the show. Thank you for those profound remarks. I mean, you said it all so well, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our first artist, the Sand Arb. The topic of her presentation tonight is the Crown Act. I learned just yesterday that our ancestors, women, when they were brought over on slave ships, braided the seeds of certain um, vegetables, eggplant kind of jumped out at me, um, into their hair. And also we've heard the stories of holding on to the seeds of okra, but I just heard, heard learned that they had it into there so they would have their favorite foods when they came here to America. So African-American women, black women and our hair is, is a <laughs> topic of, of much discussion, but unfortunately it's also been um, an opportunity for women to be harassed on the job passed over for promotions or raises, um, microaggressions, lots of things. So in response, we now have an educator and an artist born in Chicago, Illinois, currently residing in Carbondale. She has exhibited throughout the region in states like Kansas, Kentucky, Arkansas, internationally, she's exhibited in Canada, I believe you've got a show now at the Mitchell Museum in Mount Vernon. She's also um, an actress. Her main subject matter is portraiture. She's worked on paintings concerning influential people throughout the and also venturing into analog photography. Currently, she's working on a series of linoleum block prints portraying the natural hairstyles of African-Americans and the discrimination that they face in the schools and the workplace. She's inspired by Elizabeth Catlett and her strong subject matter. DeSan holds both her bachelor's and master's of fine arts from Southern Illinois University here in Carbondale. And she's been an instructor for 19 years. I give you DeSan R. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, let me start with sharing my screen. I'm new at this, so I might need help.
I can't seem to get to by PowerPoint. I can see it. I can't uh, see my menu. Let me make it small so I can see it. There we go. Beginning. Okay. Can everyone see it? Yes. Okay, thank you. As uh, Lynn said, my presentation is on the Crown Act. <clears throat> and I had uh, been you know, looking at news online and different events uh, going on. And this uh, few stories came up about how people were having a hard time at their job, about their hair, students at school, uh, you know, were being discriminated against because of their hairstyle, their natural hair. And uh, it really touched me and made me want to look more into it. And then I found out about the Crown Act. <clears throat> and the Crown Act, uh, this, pres this presentation will feature art information about a new law known as the Crown Act, creating a respect respectful and open world for natural hair. And there's the, uh, the website, www.thecrownact.com. I think I need to minimize these pictures. I'm sorry, hold on. There we go. And the National Crown Day is July 3rd to celebrate natural hair and the end of discrimination based on one's natural hair and hairstyles. For ending hair discrimination, the Crown Act was created in 2019 by Dove and the Crown Coalition in partnership with then State Senator Holly J. Mitchell of California to ensure protection against discrimination based on race-based hairstyles by extending statutory protection to hair texture and protective styles such as braids, locks, twists, and knots in the workplace and public schools. Some people may say that your hair is not important. I say, ask someone that has lost their hair and then ask them what they think about that statement. It could be gone because of a tragedy, old age, or an accident. The soulful singer India Ri says in one of her songs, I am not my hair, meaning she is not defined by her hair. She is more than that. On the other side of the spectrum, what if someone told you that because of your hair texture and how it looks, you're a distraction and you must change it or you cannot work in this establishment? This is called discrimination. That is why the Crown Act has passed in some states in America. I think it's in about maybe six or seven states right now, and they're trying to spread it to the whole United States. I have some uh, situations that I've read about, uh, three of them that I wanted to present to everyone. Discrimination number one, an African-American teenager goes to graduation practice at the high school he attends for the upcoming graduation. He is told that he must cut his locked hair. The school explains that there is a regulation in the school's rules that says he cannot have his hair that long or in that style. The teenager wanted to walk across the stage for this joyous moment. So reluctantly, he cut his hair because he really wanted to walk across that stage, that stage and get his diploma. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar what locks are, uh, they were sometimes called dreadlocks. Uh, some people have taken the word dread off of it because it, it doesn't make it sound very good. So a lot of people just called it long hair. And that's when your hair, uh, when it begins, is, is separated in parts and is twisted with certain uh, natural chemicals to adhere it together. And every month, uh, the person would have to retwist the roots re-add some of the natural moisturizers in it. And then it glows long, it grows long and it locks the hair. My daughter uh, recently had locked her hair and uh, she was uh, really happy with it. And, 
And uh, I don't think she's had any discrimination moments per se, but uh, it's definitely a journey that you have to make in embracing one's natural hair, learning to live with it, uh, learning to manage it and be happy with it. Discrimination situation number two. Young African-American girl goes to school with her hair braided. Her mother adds red ribbon in the braids and uh, some of them were extensions. The girl was sent home because of her hairstyle. She was not allowed to have her picture taken on picture day. She went home crying to her parents. In response to this horrible event, a photographer offers the girl a photo shoot of her own for free. He wanted, to know, he wanted her to know that she is beautiful the way she is. So she got this wonderful photo shoot. She dressed up in different outfits and this photographer gave her all the photos for free and did the photo shoot for free. She was very happy and pleased and it uplifted her. It did not make her feel bad about herself anymore. Discrimination number three. An African-American woman is discriminated against at her place of employment due to her natural hairstyles and braids. She takes the employer to court for discrimination. She explains that it's part of her African heritage to have her hair in cornrows, sometimes also called braids. The judge says that the African-American woman got the idea from Bo Derrick, a white actress that had her hair in braids in a film. The judge denies the lawsuit saying that her braids were not acceptable for the workplace and that it was not a case of discrimination. So she lost the case. I don't know uh, if any of you remember Bo Derek in a famous film where she had her hair French braided. And that's what the judge was referring to. He was lacking a knowledge of where the braids came from, that they are from African descent. And he basically didn't have any idea where French braids started from and it caused this person to lose her case of discrimination. A little bit on more of the Crown Act law. On July 3rd, 2019, California became the first state to legally protect the hair of black students and employees when Governor Gavin Newsom signed Senate Bill 188, also referred to as the Crown Act, create a respectful and open workplace for natural hair a law that declares hair discrimination to be illegal. Nine days later on July 12th, New York followed suit and became the second state to criminalize hair discrimination. The new California law reads, the history of our nation is riddled with laws and societal norms that equated blackness and the associated physical traits, for example, dark skin, kinky and curly hair to a badge of inferiority, sometimes subject to separate and unequal treatment. The bill goes on to say professionalism was and still is closely linked to European features and mannerisms, which entails that those who do not naturally fall into Eurocentric norms must alter their appearances, sometimes drastically and permanently, in order to be deemed professional. This article was by Jamila Nasheed. Uh, this is one of my artworks uh, that inspired me to talk more about this subject. And I call this one, the power of self, it's kind of a self-assertion and self-confident person. As I searched for images through a magazine to inspire me, this one caught my eye. I created this artwork on a linoleum block, carved the image, inked it and printed it. If you're not familiar with a linoleum block is, it's a, now there's two different kinds I've been using. There's one that's put on a wood block, pressed wood, maybe about an inch high, you know, an inch thick. And then linoleum is adhered upon it. Uh, kind of like the linoleum on a kitchen floor you might be familiar with. Now there's a, a softer kind, a soft linoleum, and it's a lot easier to carve but it, it's a little bit more difficult to print due to it having foam underneath it rather than something more solid. So I've used both and uh, 
for these three artworks I'm doing, I did actually use the soft linoleum, which is a uh, new experience for me. So uh, this person, she has her natural hair that came from her ancestors before her smile. Her smile shows her happiness. Yeah, sorry, before her, her smile shows her happiness. And you think, why would someone want to take that away from her? Why would someone want to stop her from smiling? She's smiling because she's she has the power of her self-assertion. She's confident. She's happy in her in her body and with her hair. And I wanted to depict that in this artwork. And there's a little symbol towards the lower left-hand corner that I found in uh, some of the Adinkra symbols from Af West Africa. And it, that's what the title is. It means the power of self-assertion and the self-confident person. Uh, the experience of uh, carving these linoleum blocks is always exciting because you never know how it's gonna come out until it's printed. I mean, you can imagine, but you never really know until you actually ink it, put the paper on, rub it, or run it through a press to see the outcome. Move along to the next slide. Uh, this one I entitled Incapable of Being Intimidated or Subdued. Dauntlessness and courage are symbolized by this sign. It indicates the will to persist, even when adverse circumstances make it difficult. The image I found for this artwork shows a man going or coming from work. In the original picture, he had his name badge still around his neck. I chose the symbol for the image because I can only imagine what he may go through because of his natural hair and hairstyle. He must have the will to persist, even when circumstances make it difficult. Well, that's what that symbol is, that Adinkra symbol is for West Africa. That's what that one means. And I was looking through uh, pictures online, magazines, and I came up with this one. And he has his hair, it's actually twisted and then tied on top of his head. And I was thinking when I saw the picture, I wonder if anyone said anything to him about his hairstyle or his, you know, his choice of having his natural hair that length or in that hairstyle. I'm sure he's probably been confronted by maybe somebody at his work. You never know the situation or when it will arise. And it's almost waiting for that pin to drop on the floor, uh, waiting for someone to say something. So I wanted uh, to express that he is incapable of being intimidated. He is, is uh, comfortable in his own skin and hair, and he will not be subdued. Uh, the stylized, I can't see my screen all the way, the stylized, something, uh, the feminine virtues of consideration, caution, circumspection, and tenderness. I chose an image of the back of the African-American woman because it was a usual view. Usually someone would take the photo from the front of the person. I like the way it only showed her hair in the back. The image to the left is an Adinkra symbol like the other symbols in previous slides. And it's the, the stylized comb refers to the feminine virtues of consideration, caution, circumspection, and tenderness. This comb is very vital to the African woman as she can comb her hair with it, she can style her hair with it. And uh, the other meanings, consideration, caution, circumspection and tenderness all come in within the use of that comb and what it means to comb her hair and style it. She thinks cautiously about how she prepares her hair. She is considerate and for uh, you know, grooming, if you think of grooming, you're bettering yourself, you're treating yourself with kindness, you're loving yourself. And therefore she will also treat others with that same kindness and tenderness. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Chris Rock's 2009 release of Good Hair. Uh, I remember days when I was growing up and uh, I met someone's cousin and her hair was very soft. She was African-American, but she was, uh, she was mixed. 
and her hair was very soft and curly naturally, unlike mine that I saw was very coarse, hard to manage, <laughs> and is sometimes called something called nappy. Um, and it's a uh, it's not a good term. It just it basically means your hair is coarse and hard to comb through, hard to manage. And in this film, Chris Rock does research on female African American hair and the rise of something that was called the perm or relaxer. This film brought up many conversations on African American hair. It mostly referred to what the women in the film would go through to have so-called good hair. And a perm or relaxer, you may have heard before. Uh, we called ours the relaxer, but we mistermed it the perm because perm is something different. Relaxer straightens our hair with this chemical that can burn through plastic. And in the film, uh, Good Hair, Chris Rock goes to uh, beautician places, he goes to barber shops, and they talk about this relaxer and how long you can only stay on or start to burn through your skin and your scalp. So uh, African-American women were going through this, uh, I think it mostly started in, in the late 70s, early 80s, where relaxers came out for African-Americans. Uh, it was even presented to me and I'll tell that story a little later. So uh, if you get a chance, check out Chris Rock's Good Hair. I think you can find it on uh, Amazon Prime and other movie, movie programs. And I want to say overall, we are all beautiful human beings. African-American women should not be judged or told to change something that they were born with and that which is natural. And I put quotations on natural because here is my natural, but it was a bad hair day because I was supposed to, at night, I usually wet it. I had to wet it, separate it, braid it, and put rollers on it to get it to curl up and look like a better Afro. So I fell asleep and this is what I woke up with for pick today. <laughs> it's not that bad, but I was disappointed in myself that I did not um, stay awake long enough to do that. I was 12 in this picture and it was uh, my freshman uh, year picture. So this is me in my natural state. I wanted to talk about um, how my mother became a beautician and she learned how to do uh, relaxers on hair. And so she gave me and my sister one and we were kind of excited. It's like, oh, I don't have to you know, struggle with my hair. I can have it straight and I can comb it easily. I can curl it, put it in different styles. So it was exciting, but not knowing the damage that relaxers can do to you over the years. I didn't find this out until I dyed my hair blonde and put relaxer on it. Almost all my hair fell out. It looked like cats had been sucking on it. <laughs> it was really bad. And I, I dang near cried. I was like, oh my goodness, what have I done? So know what you're doing when you're dealing with uh, the thing called relaxers. And that's when I decided to go natural and I didn't use relaxers anymore. I still color my hair because I'm trying to hide the gray. <laughs> but um, as for relaxers, I don't use them anymore. And I don't, I don't really don't recommend anyone else to use them anymore. Uh, it's, it damages your skin. If it can burn through plastic, imagine what it's doing to your scalp and your body. So this is my presentation. I hope I did 15 minutes. <laughs> or close to it. And thank you for your time. Thank you so thank you so much, Desan. Do, does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, Lynn, tell me how do I get back to the screen? Um, just... stop, there should be something that says stop sharing, perhaps at the top. Okay, you share your screen. It's a red button. Got it. Thank there you. you go. Thank you. That was just excellent. And, you know, as you were talking about the, the price that we pay for good hair, my scalp started just remembering how many times I got my hair relaxed and 
sitting there literally crying sometimes in the chair and how much freer it is now. I've been natural for five years now and Mm -hmm. it was the best decision. I think one of the best that I've made. So yeah, I can definitely relate to that. (laughs) And you know, the, the whole thing about straightening your hair, it's the whole acculturation piece too. You know, do we do we straighten our hair so we can um, be more acceptable to mainstream, to white America? We're less threatening if we have hair that flows. And so, you know, it's all kind of psychological things that I had to kind of process and get through with with my hair. So other comments, questions? Hello. Hi, Malika. Hey, it's Malika here. Um, I'm actually, I'm a hairstylist for anyone who doesn't know. I'm actually working right now. And it's interesting you started talking about perms because I was actually just talking to my client who's in here listening with me. And I'm like, no, we're not perming your hair. She's like, oh, well, I just, I knew I want to straighten out that I'm like, no, no perms. <laughs> so it was just interesting how you just got on here and just gave the whole lecture for me. So it was like right on time. It was a divine intervention. All so, right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So what do you, are you still there? Are you, are, what are you recommending for your clients? To, what to have done to their hair? For them, they just get silk pressed. It's a more strategic technique to get the hair really silky and straight. And so that's just a better option instead of putting chemicals in it. And it also gives you the opportunity to go back to your natural curl instead of wetting your hair and then it doesn't do anything. It just stays straight like with a perm. So just a regular okay. silk press, a Brazilian blowout. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Malika. Of course. With that, well, I, enjoy, I enjoy both speakers so far, Mr. Taylor and the sand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, there's lots more Ahead, and Dr. Taylor, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our next artist. That's awesome. Uh, Mr. Ketchens, uh, if I assassinate any words while I'm reading this, just please uh, forgive me in advance because I'm doing my best here. Mm-hmm. But uh, I get the distinct pleasure of introducing Robert Ketchens tonight. And Mr. Ketchens is a social realist painter. Uh, he's known for his layered artworks that are rich and deep in both color and symbolism. Not intending to be didactic, he creates paintings that reflect the social distinctions and complexities of the African diaspora. Ketchin's work is rooted in traditional theory made fresh with modern applications and sensibility. He is drawn into contemporary and historical themes that are symbolic of the larger search for dignity and humanity in Black people. In his paintings, you will find visual quotes from noted American masters such as Henry Tanner, Romero Ber- Bearden and Charles White. Uh, Mr. Ketchens was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 19, you want me to say 52? (laughs) In the late 1970s, he was given the opportunity to study abroad in Wiesbaden, Germany, where he learned traditional techniques in painting. These techniques have remained as a solid foundation through the continuing body of his work. He's had solo exhibitions nationwide, including those at the Rosemary Burkle and the Harriel Crisp Museum in Fonbon University Museum, and the Margaret Harwell Museum, and the Ducible Museum in Chicago. The selected group ex- exhibitions include the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, the Missouri History Museum in St. Louis, and the Museum Center of Records and Documents for Senegal in Senegal, West Africa. His work is held in numerous public and private collections, most notably the permanent collection of the Illinois State Museum and the Missouri History Museum. Among his awards, he is the 2016 Purchase Award recipient in the 22nd African American Art Exhibition in Louisville, Kentucky. His public works include a mural of the famous Olympian Jesse Owens commissioned by Focus Films for the movie Race in 2016. Recently, Ketchens has received a commission from the Missouri History of Museum to complete four portraits of St. Louis's African American civil rights leaders and activists for their 2017 exhibition titled, Number One in Civil Rights, The African American Freedom Struggle in St. Louis. Ketchens lives and works in O'Fallon, Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Robert Ketchens. 
you very much, Doctor. Hello, everyone. And happy Juneteenth, uh, Emancipation Day, as I like to call it. And uh, if you have any relatives in Texas, let them know that. Uh, <laughs> we've got a holiday. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen with you on uh, the travels I did down south, uh, making connections uh, and trying to understand the blues and uh, its, uh, its roots in American music. Um, I was accompanied there with, uh, by a friend of mine, an artist, uh, William Burton Jr. And um, we did about uh, four trips uh, down the Mississippi Delta, uh, met a lot of friends and uh, gathered a lot of information. Brought it back and put the show together called A Song from the Field. Are you gonna move it or should I? Next. You can. I can. You okay. gotta share your screen though. Okay. Oh, I didn't share the screen yet? Oh my. Just a second, please. Green button at the bottom. Ah, okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. There it is. So you know I'm a newbie at this, right? <laughs> Doing fine. Okay. First slide sort of sums up uh, the entire trip. Um, the influences uh, uh, in the Southern uh, Delta, Mississippi Delta that uh, brought about uh, uh, this combination of um, songs and verses and uh, sounds uh, from Africa, uh, back to the struggles of the South and, uh, and the plantation struggles that they all uh, went through. Um, we've got um, several people, Betsy Smith um, represented here. Um, uh, that's uh, old man Patton, who's supposed to be the father of the blues. Um, these are some uh, Africans from Mali and uh, for the South and, and uh, in the uh, cotton industry, Mali was a very important place uh, to transport uh, slaves because they grew some of the best uh, cotton in the world. And uh, once they realized that, um, this area of Mount Bayou uh, specifically uh, went after slaves um, that were from uh, Mali. Second slide here is... Um, uh, the mother of the blues. And um, I use traditional icon of, uh, of Christian uh, imagery um, to project this image uh, with all of the masses uh, that, uh, that are well known surrounding it. Cotton fields and the church and hard times were just a part of everyday life for them. Here's a marker in uh, Clarks, Clarksdale, Mississippi, blues marker. And it calls uh, W.C. Handy, the father of the blues. Well, he's very important in, uh, in ex extending the blues to the, to the rest of us because uh, he collected and later published uh, uh, a lot of uh, influential music and as I say, his own music. But he's far from the father of blues. This painting is titled Legends and uh, in the House of the Rising Sun. And we're depicting a Sun House, which is one of the most important uh, blues artists uh, in the Mississippi Delta region. Not that he was so famous, but he launched the career of so many that looked uh, and copied his music um, that you can't follow the blues without running into a uh, sun house. Here's a young B.B. Um, uh, King, uh, Betsy Smith again, and uh, John Lee Hooker all together. This is an acrylic painting uh, with uh, photo montages added to it. Um, it was a total change in my style at the time. Um, 
I totally erased everything that I was familiar with as far as visual uh, imagery so that I could bring some truth to what I was uh, studying down there. And uh, this is the style that I came up with. Very happy with it. Um, this is a story of uh, Robert Johnson, the guy who famously, supposedly sold his soul to the devil so he could become one of the most famous uh, guitar players. Um, Clarksdale, Mississippi is a big place um, for a lot of these blues players. Um, here I've got the train tracks represented. Most of the train tracks and, and the blues players were, were hand in hand. Um, uh, everywhere in Mississippi, you know, there are train tracks running through every part of the Mississippi Delta, there's train tracks running through. And those train tracks carry dreams of uh, a lot of people. Uh, some missed boats, some didn't, but on these trains, they call the, the trains uh, uh, rail chariots, which would get them out. Um, here I try to depict the heat, extreme heat of the Mississippi Delta with that sun. Can you see the partner here? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. And here's a marker, uh, said the, the crossroads, um, which the marker really is, uh, it just uh, is a monument for tourists. You know? As I see it, the crossroads was not a physical place, but it was a perfect uh, metaphor for the perils of, of ego. So when you go to Clarksdale, um, it's just a, uh, just a sign. There's no action that actually happened on those two corners there. <laughs> um, here is a, a famous uh, blues man, uh, Lead Belly. Uh, uh, Lead Belly wrote a lot of uh, uh, super hits. He was a great songwriter. Um, hits like uh, Black Belly, Black Betty, House of the Rising Sun, and CC Rider. All of those became um, hits when they were called it later years. Um, he was a scrapper in life, and so that shortened his career, but uh, a great, uh, great musician and songwriter. And uh, here I put him in prison pants because he spent about half his life in prison, the other half with the guitar. This title is uh, Conflicted. It shows Howlin' Wolf belting out his devil music and a young church member clinging to a Bible. Um, back then they called it the devil music because it was influencing people to do devil dances or whatever they thought it was at the time. Um, here I included, once again, his son house, um, the working fields, um, the churches, and the music that they played when they got together. Um, it was said that uh, they were leg shaking with Wolf on Saturday night and raising their hands with the preacher on Sunday. This image is called a Saturday serenade. And one of the best ways to get a woman was to have a guitar down there, whether it was a regular store-bought guitar or three-string homemade guitar. And uh, this try to show the sentimentality of the moments in such hard times of uh, uh, sharecropping. Um, uh, there were still some tender moments, people lived. Um, this is uh, titled Ground Zero. It, uh, this joint is in Clarksdale, uh, Mississippi, still exists. It's uh, owned by Morgan Freeman. Some of the best cooks uh, in Mississippi uh, are down there. And uh, Ground Zero, the painting is saying that the early sound of the blues men and women that played will always be echoed in the sounds of the blues players today. It's so deeply rooted in American music that uh, you can't escape going back to the licks, improving on the licks, and making the music richer. Back here is the ghost of John Lee Hooker.
His next side uh, is titled When Chance and Change Collides. Um, it shows the, the harmonica greats, um, Sonny Boy, Wilson, uh, Little Walter, and uh, Howlin' Wolf. They all were great on harmonicas. I put the cotton pickers in the field and instead of actually painting the train, I used the harmonicas to, uh, to simulate the train, if you can see that. Holland Wolf, Lil Walter, and um, Sonny Boy. This is a nod to uh, Muddy Waters. Uh, it's titled From Rolling Folk, Mississippi to Chicago. Uh, Muddy Waters, again, his son house was very influential in, in the teaching of uh, Muddy Waters. Uh, some of the area that Muddy Waters uh, grew up in, I used photographs uh, to capture that. Uh, once again, the church and the young Muddy Waters here uh, playing next to a guy with a fiddle. Uh, the blues and country music is, is so very related. You know, they're, 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 they're like kiss, kissing cousins. Uh, they both come from the suffering of, uh, of, of people. Uh, Marty Waters was famous for electrifying the blues and made, he made way for, for rock and roll. Mm -hmm. One of his major influence uh, was again, uh, Sunhouse. Next slide is uh, the international star, B.B. King. Uh, title was Born to the Blues. Um, Here's a young B.B. King, I really like this one. When he was first starting out, struggling artists, we all artists can, can relate to that. Where uh, to make money, he's got the uh, radio station uh, advertisement on his, painted on his guitar. Uh, that's great in the barrel. <laughs> Here's Sunhouse again. And B.B. Um, King, of course, became everyone's uh, sweetheart. So that's why I've got the Got the big red heart there. And, uh, this painting is titled, What Was Old Is New? And this is a salute to contemporary blues players of today and others that continue to grow the music. Um, here in St. Louis, they have a, a young man I met when he was 19 years old, I think it was. Uh, Marquise Knox and uh, to listen to Marquise uh, play the blues is like going back in time to listen to one of the really old guys. Uh, it's not an act. He just naturally had that voice and that soul for blues music. One of his favorites was uh, Robert Johnson. It's a three string uh, cigar box guitar that I mentioned earlier. Um, those who couldn't afford uh, a guitar, they made one themselves. Uh, and the necks of the, the sticks were so small that they could only include uh, three strings instead of four. Um, it's a closer image of the cigar box that I painted. And this is a replication of a uh, really wonderful night I had at the uh, Red's place in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Um, and the guy that's uh, playing right here, he was an old guy, 79 years old, still playing, uh, called Billy Bo. There's Billy Bo right there. In the jig joint. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I did this uh, work collaboratively with uh, another artist, William Burton, and I'm gonna share uh, some of his work uh, with you now. There's a piece called Sweat Equity. I really like this piece because sweat equity is spelled out in pennies. Very, very strong piece. Is another piece, Capital of United States.
interactive piece. Sometime you would go and the gallery, he would have this cage closed. Other times he would have the cage open. It meant a lot. Small pieces, uh, the wood burns, uh, uh, pyro, pyrographics, I think. Uh, it's a technique, it's burning in wood. Nice sentimental piece. Once again, here's a piece here that uh, called Migration. Once again, uh, paying homage to the, the train tracks and their way out of the site, the south. Cotton Belt route. It was a major train uh, route that came uh, through the Delta and it was coming through at least twice a week to load up cotton. So uh, everybody who wanted to get out of there knew about the cotton belt route. <clears throat> Harvesting Southern Roots. Really nice people. Got a young man coming out of the, out of the field and out of the cotton. A monocle players from Obscurity I Shine. A lot of artists have done that. Mama Magnolia. I think these are uh, uh, lead pencil on, on paper or graphite on paper. Here's the painting uh, from the fields. Because uh, you see Ma Rainey here. Uh, everybody probably know Ma Rainey because of the, the movie now. Before that, no one probably really heard of her except those who Really love the blues. Powerful lady, strong woman, independent woman, like the like the movie show. Is a piece a deal in the Delta showing uh, Robert Johnson uh, with the church in the background, dark clouds or raven, and uh, dark eerie path leading back to the church. Last slide here is titled 40 Acres and a Mule Still Waiting. Mm -hmm. This is a, an all uh, on wood panel and it's about 10 by 10 inches. Um, there's a lot of hard work, um, but a lot of your jubile times uh, down there. Um, Life was rough, but uh, enjoyable times were very enjoyable. And uh, because of that, out of their struggles, we got this wonderful genre we call uh, the blues. And that's a wrap for me, folks. Any I have a question. Thank yeah. you, Robert. Uh, do you have a Facebook page with your uh, work on? Yes, I do. Is it under your name or is it under your yeah, business? Yeah, it's under my name. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's under my name. Thank you. Your work is beautiful. Thank you. We're going to post a PowerPoint um, in the chat box that has everyone that's involved with tonight's show, their contact information. Um, it Not the images. We respect artists and we don't share their images. But... Your, the contact information, Ami will have that posted so you can um, find these folks and, and look at their amazing work. Dr. Yeah. Taylor, any comments or as you open the floor for questions? I just want to say I grew up on the blues. I mean, so I've listened to, I mean, the women and the artists that you mentioned, Robert Johnson kind of started it off, but I mean, T Bone Walker, uh, I'm trying to think of. The, the, my brain is John Lee Hooker. You, I think you mentioned Ma Rainey, Helen Wolf, uh, Buddy Guy. Um, yeah. I mean, so I mean, and then I grew kind of in a different direction and, and, <laughs> and grew into heavy metal, which really had its roots in blues. I mean, so you learn a strong uh, a passion for the blues and you can translate that in multiple uh, genres of music for sure. I mean, even country and Western for sure. You know, you saw. Uh, B.B. King and um, others kind of make over, I mean, you even see some crossover in country today uh, with some 
with some artists that were kind of blues oriented. And I, and I also had dreadlocks at one point in my career. I'm gonna have to find that picture, Lynn, and see if I can share it with you. Please I, do, please <laughs> do. And I have to uh, have to agree with the, the person they talked about the, the chemicals because now I don't have any hair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, what you mentioned about uh, going to rock and roll. Um, uh, Robert Palmer, who uh, did about every year he go down to Clarksdale, Mississippi for the uh, Sunflower Festival. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a, a stone rock and roller, but uh, he's a practitioner of the blues. Robert Plant. I, I grew up listening to people like Willie Dixon again, Elmore James, uh, Albert King, you know, Lightning, uh, what was his name, Hopkins maybe, uh, Memphis, her name, Memphis. Memphis Many. Memphis Many, yes. Ray Charles, I'm in love with Ray Charles, man. He is, he is, he was just awesome. So um, this kind of took me down a, a path I hadn't been down in a while. So thank you. Wonderful. And that's that's what these conversations and these opportunity to be exposed to these amazing artists. Um, Robert, I almost hate to ask you to stop sharing your screen because you've got one of my favorite pieces. Oh. I'm going to I'm gonna have to get to work hard so I can um, purchase that one there in the <laughs> background. Uh, <laughs> that's queen like, isn't it? <laughs> it you got it. It no. is. These are coming those colors too. So um, we appreciate you so much for being here. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Ketchens before we move forward? Did you mention the piece with the harmonicas? Okay, I, I had to. I had to do an intervention with my dog, and I think I missed that. But that's yeah. also that's one of my good. favorite pieces, and just. To me, just to come up with the concept of the harmonica of different notes. So um, put that on my list. No, that one's sold already too, but maybe I can afford a G Clay. Well, this was, yeah, this was one of the pieces that uh, I know so, some of the artists I can relate to uh, with it that I, I really hated to sell this piece. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. it it came upon me, the inspiration to do it came upon me out of the blue, uh, but uh, money talks. <laughs> and the I've got a, I got my eye on a couple of pieces too, so. All right. All right, how are we doing guys? Do you guys need a, a, a five minute stretch break or should we continue? Let me know. Um, you can give me a thumbs up if we should continue or let me know if we need a, five minute break. Uh, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. okay. Good. All right. Okay. Well, they voted for everybody. <laughs> so we're going to move forward. Um, the next artist, thank you again, Robert. I really appreciate you being with us tonight. Thank you. For having the me. next the next artist that I have the pleasure of introducing to you is Dr. Michael Ferris. And um, there was a misprint on the flyer. The show that he's presenting tonight is the Riot Show. So I apologize for the misprint, Mike. It's not Springfield Riot. The name of the show is called The Riot Show. Dr. Michael Ferris is an artist. He has taught at Northwest Missouri State University in Maryville, Missouri, Shawnee Community College in Ullen, and Centralia High School in Centralia, Illinois. He's also exhibited in very strategic, I'm sorry, prestigious, probably strategic too, but prestigious <laughs> uh, venues such as the Cranzenberg Art Center in St. Louis, the St. Louis Art Guild, the Evansville Museum of Arts and Science, Southern Illinois University, in Carbondale, the Indianapolis Center, the Springfield Art Association, Cedarhurst Center for the Arts, Carbondale Community Arts, and many other locations. Dr. Ferris earned his PhD in art education at Indiana University in Bloomington. He lives with his lovely wife, Deborah, and hopefully they're relocating back to Southern Illinois, 
but I'll let you, I'll let Mike tell you about that. But without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Mike Ferris. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. And yes, Lynn, we have moved back to Southern Illinois. We're living in Belleville now, over by Robert. All right. Yeah. Now, I want to give you a little, uh, I guess, a prelude to what I'm going to show you today. Um, for years, I've been a, a, an artist who cared about social issues, and a lot of my artwork reflected that. And then a lot of times it was sort of, I guess you could say in the abstract, and it was more historical than it was contemporary with the subject matter. And then uh, Ferguson happened and something clicked in my head and I realized that it was time to be a little more active with contemporary issues. It was so close to home and it was, it was so violent and I'd seen it happen so many times before. And uh, I wanted to make artwork related to, to that concept and uh, to the idea of, uh, of what's been happening and what, what's it mean to, to, what's riot mean? What's the difference between a demonstration and a riot? Uh, depends on who's describing it, it seems like to me. So that's what the whole series is about. And I ended up making 20 different artworks. I use a lot of different media. I've been a high school art teacher and I've been a community college art teacher. So I'm pretty good with a lot of different media and it does help to keep me interested when I try new things. It's a new challenge every time when I try a new medium. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with that. Crispy, juicy, and tender. Let's see, share screen. Share. The green button at the bottom. There you go. Got it. And here we go. Right, show. And let me move down here. All right. When I have that slideshow from the beginning. All right, can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yeah. So this is the riot show by me. And it's, it's sort of the way I've organized this tonight is in a chronological order. It's gonna show what happened. I left some of the works out because they, um, I was concerned about time constraints. And I'm also gonna talk about critical race theory for a little while before we get started. So the riot show is a group of 20 sequential artworks that demonstrates the tactics used against people. Uh, let me move this. For minority populations by law enforcement officials in the United States. The riot show starts with the black person being killed by the police, then proceeds through the discrediting of the victim, the ensuing demonstrations, the brutal responses from law enforcement, the manipulation of public media, and the machinations of politicians who work with a white agenda in mind. This is nothing new. It's been going on for my whole life. Uh, we can go back to decades, to the 60s, at least. That's when I started noticing it, when I was a child. And I understand in the riot show, this is a history lesson. The actions depicted in this series have been happening for hundreds of years. And the riot show is based on a component of critical race theory, which we'll talk about in a minute. Mm. Critical race theory was developed by Derek Bell and other legal scholars in the 1970s. The main tenets of critical race theory are that systemic racism exists and maintains power through the law and transforming the relationship between law and racial power, and also achieving racial emancipation and anti-subordination are possible. Uh, let me see if I can move this. Politicians all over the United States right now are working to keep 
critical race theory out of school curricula. Six points of critical race theory, and this is from Derek Bell and other people. Number one, racism is ordinary, not aberrational. Two, white over everything serves psychological and material purposes for the dominant or hegemonic group. Three, race is a social construct. It has nothing to do with anything other than separation. Dominant society, number four, dominant society racializes different minority groups at different times in response to shifting needs such as the labor market. Five, each race has its own origins and ever evolving history. And six, because of different histories and experiences, matters that the white people are unlikely to know about must be communicated to them by racialized minorities. The riot show operates as a component of critical race theory known as critical enlightenment theory, which asserts that certain tactics can be used by the dominant, that used by the dominant group can be identified and documented, then can be combated through various means. And that some of those means are legislative. And here's the artwork. And I'm just starting at the beginning. This one's called, uh, by the way, this is a pinhole camera photograph that I made and then blew up. This is a big piece. And I used multiple images of it. Um, and I added the, the body. It's called Man Shot Dead by Police. And I like the black and white version of it. And I love pinhole camera images because they give it kind of a dreamy quality and uh, kind of a blurry look. And uh, this is how we start. This is how the riot show starts. This one's called How to Discredit a Dead Man. It's a mono print. It's 10 by eight real small piece. Uh, after the, a person's killed by the police, they like to do an autopsy and they like to find trace amounts of some sort of drug. And then they like to publicize that in the newspapers and in the media so that they can discredit the person who's been killed. This happens all the time. It's been happening for years, trace amounts. By the way, well, let me go back to that. I used as the model for this, this person is Emery Douglas. Emery Douglas was the, is one of my heroes in art. Emery Douglas was the printmaker and the, the person who made all the artwork for the Black Panthers in the 1960s. He's still alive. He lives in Los Angeles and still makes artwork. I don't know how you feel about being in this. This one's called Choose Sides. This is a mono print. And this, something like this happened in Ferguson when uh, a bunch of rednecks showed up with assault rifles in the middle of the day and the police allowed them to come behind the barricades with them and point their weapons at the demonstrators. Happened more than once. It happened for several days. And this is my interpretation of that. This is, this is a statement on the way police dress these days. They like to get the riot gear out and they like to intimidate people. It's called Dress for Success. And it's, it's a model's runway and the people are acting like they're looking at models. and the police are in their regalia. This is a mono print. This is called Two Ways to Anger White People. This is an enlarged mono print. It's a pretty big piece. Uh, when, what, one of the things you saw on Facebook was uh, there are a lot of people who think that because uh, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, has demonstrations that they are uh, vandals and they are causing the problem and all this business when in fact uh, 
the movement has rejuvenated civil rights in the United States. Another thing that makes white people mad is a black person or anybody else wearing a ball cap backwards, which is unbelievable to me how incensed, incensed people get over such a minor thing, but it still happens, believe me. This is a, a drawing. It's called Ferguson, Missouri, Whitey on the Moon. And I got that title from uh, Gil Scott Heron's poem, Whitey on the Moon, because I, I noticed when the cops got all dressed up, they looked kind of like astronauts. And I was thinking about Heron's po great poem, you know, um, about the poverty in the United States for for certain people and then the millions that are spent to put Whitey on the moon. And so I put that cop on the moon there and made this little town that was supposed to represent Ferguson and all those people whose faces are in the picket fences were victims of police violence. This is called Police Machines an allegory of oppression. And this is an oil painting. And in recent years, the cops have been buying, um, it's like military surplus armored vehicles. And they like to trot those out to, to intimidate demonstrators. And that, that's what this painting is about is these giant armored vehicles. This is called White Code. It's sort of related to that uh, discrediting that they do. And that the model I have up there is J-Bo from uh, Jay-Z's great video uh, about OJ, the Ballad of OJ. And you have this spokesman for the police calling this guy a rioter, a thug, a looter, a thief, an animal, you know, all these code words that the cops use and other people in law enforcement for people who in a lot of cases didn't do much of anything to deserve being murdered. This is another thing that really happened. This is a big mono print. Uh, in Ferguson, there were certain businesses that the police would form a circle around every night. McDonald's was one of those in Ferguson. The cops would protect McDonald's. But there were other businesses, if, if the business wasn't a, a big corporate business, if it was locally owned, or if maybe they didn't give a contribution to the, uh, to the local police, then they just let them go. And uh, of course, one of those in Ferguson was the, uh, was the convenience store. And I've got a piece about that too. This one's called To Protect and Serve. And of course they're protecting and serving McDonald's. Here's what happened to the convenience store. And this is called Unprotected and Unserved Convenience Store. And they called the reporters over, the police did, and told them they wanted them to film this. They chased the reporters away from all kinds of different places, but they wanted them to see that this convenience store, they were allowing it to be uh, looted. They were standing 20 feet from it. They could have stopped this, but they didn't want to. And this is what happens with uh, the cops will catch people, demonstrators and beat them up and spray gas on them and things like that. And shoot them with rubber bullets or whatever, beat them with clubs. This is called the rhythm of pain. This is another mono print. This is my painting of Dr. King. I said I'd been seeing this for years. We'd all been seeing it for years. This is when Dr. King got arrested in Birmingham and got roughed up by the police. It's, a, it's based on a famous photograph, but I made it into sort of a Cubist painting. But uh, even celebrity civil rights workers have been beaten by the police. There was a state representative at 
at uh, Ferguson who got uh, really sick from the tear gas in the middle of the day. You know, there wasn't, you know, it was unnecessary. And then there are always people who want to talk about the, the vandalism involved in a demonstration. Why do they burn cars? Well, up at the top of this, you can see why they burn cars. And that word, they, they. I've talked to my students for decades about that word and how harmful it is, they. Uh, it creates separation. Uh, it's a word used by white supremacists and other bigots. Uh, it separates us from them, right? Mm -hmm. So this one's called, yeah, why do they burn cars? And then this is the last piece in, the, in this series it's called Whitestown. There really is a place called Whitestown in Indiana. And uh, I had to take a picture of their water tower and uh, I put it in Washington, D.C. because so many of the politicians, um, one way or another, support white supremacy. And the little hands up there are probably familiar to most of you. And uh, of course, Trump was president uh, by the time I started on this. Okay, and that is it for mine, the right show. All I can say is wow, Mike. Wow. Intense awesome. and thought provoking. Robert, you had a comment? No, I just said it was uh, it was awesome uh, pieces. I, I saw the show before and uh, looking at it again, just as powerful as it was the first time I saw him. Thank you, Robert. I, uh, when I was uh, the president of the American Museum- Commissions are coming. I'm sorry, Najar. Oh, okay. Uh, when I was the president of the American Museum, uh, I uh, worked with, uh, uh, Mike to uh, bring that show here to Carbondale at the museum. And I remember him asking me a question. He was wondering how people would respond to the fact that here's a white man, quote unquote, because I have, I have problems saying calling him white man, considering the fact that how white is defined within a social construct as related to the human experience. But nevertheless, uh, the show, he was saying, I want to see people, you know, there's going to be any problems with, you know, how they going to respond to this. And the response was excellent. He, and we both was uh, like, wow, it, it, it was uh, uh, it was something that it was a, one of those narratives that people seemed like they was waiting to have but couldn't have. And so it, and it turned out to be an excellent exhibition for us. And he, and he came in and then we also got brought him in to, to uh, give a presentation. And so and I'm still thanking him for, for doing that. Uh, it was a it was a very uh, a culturally beautiful. courageous. Wow. Thank you, Nadir. Yeah. Oh, that was very really informational, Dr. Mike. I really like that. I'm 53 years old and I didn't even know half of that stuff that you were saying. I wasn't even aware. I think there are a lot of people who are uh, maybe intimidated by the term critical race theory. I think that's probably a thing that's been happening lately because of the media because there are a lot of people who are afraid to, for instance, confront racism and particularly confront systemic racism because it, a lot of particularly white people, they feel like they've been complicit somehow. And in a lot of cases, I'd say they probably have been, but that's a tough thing for people to admit. It's a, a really tough thing for people to own up to. And I think until you were, really kind of look more closely at critical race theory, you, you might not understand what it's, what it's all about, but it really is about revealing the things that have been going on here for centuries in it, not only this country, but other countries as well, but specifically this country because Derek Bell was from the United States. Thank you, Dr. Ferris. Thank um, you. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce our final speaker and artist presenter for the evening.
Dr. Taylor, I think you're muted. I made the rookie Zoomer mistake. <laughs> Sorry, folks. I'm, I'm happy to be able to introduce the final uh, artist of the evening. Uh, it's Mr. or Professor Najar Abdul Musawir. Uh, Najar was born in October 25th, 1958, in Chicago, Illinois, and is an internationally acknowledged artist who has exhibited in the United States, Africa, Asia, and Europe. He is a professor at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale in the College of Liberal Arts, where in 2009, he was awarded the Distinguished Judge William Holmes Cook Professorship Endowment. Professor Musa Weir has a very distinguished record and it's gonna take me a minute to go through some of this stuff. But he includes being a panelist for the Black Art in America Fine Arts Show in Houston. He is the first an artist in residency ex exhibit in the Nanmandi Center for the Contemporary Arts in Detroit. He was commissioned to create a piece for our visions of our 44th president at the Charles H. Wright Museum in Detroit. He's presented at the Underrepresented Minorities Art Exhibition at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion at Washington University in St. Louis. He's presented at the Black Creativity Exhibition in Illinois Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. He's received an invitation by MacArthur Foundation to be a member of the Illinois Artists Consulting Team in Chicago. He's presented the Telling the Tales narrative threads of contemporary African-American art at the Mitchell Museum in Mount Vernon. He's presented at Panifest Art Exhibit at the Cultural Art Center in Cape Coast, Ghana. In 2019, he had a solo exhibit called The State of Triple Consciousness at the Clemens Fine Arts Center in Paducah. In 2011, he had a solo exhibit called Harvesting an Artist's Mind Paintings and Drawings by Najar at the Surplus Gallery. In 2011, he had a solo exhibit called Muhammad Speaks, Preserving an American Voice and Residency at Tukanu Fozia Museum and, and Gallery at the University of Science in Malaysia. In 2009, he had a solo exhibit called From Change to Change at Carbondale Civic Center and Corridor Gallery and was co-sponsored by the African American Museum of Southern Illinois. And in 2008, he has a solo exhibit at Billiken University in Ankara, Turkey. Professor Musa Weir's work illustrates culture, faith, and history through an abstract language. He uses different materials as a metaphor for the human experience and thus abstract materials to discuss our abstract experience. His paintings are harmonious visions of contrasting colors, flowing liquefaction, and symbolic transparency. Nishar is known for his bur using burlap sacks material in his paintings and considers it a profound symbol. The idea of burlap exploiting the surface, which speaks to the power of harvesting the spiritual experiences of the human will, past, present, and beyond the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Musa Weir. Thank you very much, Dr. T uh, Taylor, for that introduction. Thank you. Uh, it's always an honor and a privilege to, uh, to be amongst my peers or be a, amongst anyone who has a desire to uh, be engaging in com a conversation with art, but also have an opportunity to be before art, being able to see it. Uh, if they say a picture is worth a what? Somebody, give me an answer. Thousand words. All right, all right. <laughs> It's old school. So it's, it's one of those things <laughs> where, you know, I'm, I, I really feel this is, uh, was a great opportunity. Uh, what I'd like to, uh, I would like to start with the fact that in 2002, in 2002, I actually did a, 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 a print, and I'm gonna pull my screen up here, which I thought was interesting. Let me see, let me go back, I gotta open it up. Let me see, open up the, yeah, there we go. There we go, here we go. There we go. I, I did a, a piece. When I, let, me, let me back up for a second, if I may. When I had the right to do this, if two books actually came to mind when I was asked to, to participate in the healing of Illinois, 
And when I, and it, it just kind of, and, and I said, well, I got, I have to be a part of this project. I, I have to be involved in this. And the book that, uh, the, one of the books that I was interested in that I, that I purchased some time ago and, and been reading is how to be an anti-racist, right? Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim uh, Kendi, Akindas, if I'm correct. And the reason I like this particular book, not, uh, more while going into a the long discourse about the content, uh, 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 at the beginning of several of the chapters, he, de he defined the terms, he defined certain terms. And by defining those terms, I knew going into the chapter how he, how he thought about the term that he was talking about, that it was consistent. It's sometimes when we get into a conversation with each other, we could be talking about the same thing, but, but have two different definitions of what we're talking about. And we arguing about something that we shouldn't be arguing about. And so this, that's what I find very interesting about this particular text. The second text is this one here by Henry Muhammad. What every parent should know about the worship of human images in religion and their children's mental health. And I find this, his piece to be very interesting because it becomes a, a, a issue of him addressing how the idea of racism plays a role in the idea of religion. Even in, when we think about when we think about the angels, I remember when I was a kid, I thought all the angels were white. All the, all the books, book, Bibles and books and images I saw, they were white. And so the idea of heaven, when I thought of heaven, I always thought of heaven as being white. And, and, that, and Dick Gregory made a joke one time <laughs> in a conversation, said, oh yeah, it's black people in heaven, they was in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, wow, Dick, I said, that's, that's, that's pretty heavy. And so these particular two books, some reason popped in my head, some others books popped in my head, but these two particular ones, when we start talking about the process of healing. One of the, the pieces I mentioned earlier is that I did in 2002. It's called Confronting Whiteness. And the, the, I created the American flag sent, and with the statement, how white am I? I had to ask myself, how white am I? So before, before this opportunity even presented itself, I was already in the mindset of how important it is for us, and when I say us, I mean all of us. I don't care if you're black, white, or doodle green. The fact is we all need to ask ourselves, how white are we? Because white supremacy is not something that's, that's only limited to people of European descent. There's, because if we look at the term white supremacy, that means elevating those ideas and principles associated with white being white. And if, if, you, if you're Asian and you're doing it, it's white supremacy. If you're attacking people, if you're making, if you're judging and discriminating them based on that, based on that criteria, that's white supremacy. If you if you kill somebody because that particular ideology influenced you, you, you you're exercising that. So I'm sitting here thinking about what do I, how do I become a part, how do I become a part of this dialogue? Excuse me come about this dialogue in terms of the work. So I want to engage in some work that actually made me think about this whole idea of the process of healing in, uh, in America. I want to also mention, up, I love, I'm, I'm quoting Dick Gregory again. I had opportunity to do a, a, a piece of artwork about Dick Gregory. This now at the per, has a permanent home in the Varsity Art Theater in Carmendale, Illinois. When I, when, I, when I agreed to do the project with Dick Gregory, I said, I have to meet Dick Gregory because he's living. He's not dead like Ma uh, Malcolm X or uh, uh, Martin Luther King. I have to, I, but if I do something about someone that's living, I have to go see them. And so when I met with him, I actually was doing sketches of him as he talked to me. We was having a conversation. And during the conversation, I would take make notes in the drawings about things he would say. Now I didn't bring, I'm not presenting those today to show, to, I'm not showing anyone these, these drawings today, but I just want to mention that doing that, uh, doing that interview and doing that uh, a sitting for me, for, for me, he made a statement. We were talking about healing too, ironically, about racism and this whole idea how the fireman is his uh, hero and that uh, the reason he's hero because a fireman go in and save anybody. I don't care if it's a dog, cat, black, white, whatever, they go in there and they save people. And so he, he said, that's there, his hero. But when we was talking about healing, 
Dick Curry said, and I quote, there's it's pain in healing. And I actually put that into the painting. I, put, I actually gave him a button on his uh, suit coat saying pain in healing. And, and, and I thought, wow. I, 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 I broke that down and I had to think about it. I'm like, wow. Because what made it interesting was the fact is, if I ask you, how white are you? That can, that can really start a fight. If I say that to someone black, if I say something that to someone that's white, someone white may t t say, "Well, I, I'm I'm very white." Da, 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 da. You know, a, a black person say, uh, I, ain't, "I ain't white." Da, da, da. Just because I do this and do that, don't mean I'm white. Because, but we have to remember when we use the term white or we use the term black, or anything we're not talking about skin color, Re are we really? What we're talking about is ideology. We're talking about principles and systems, and so as a result. I did this piece. Can y'all see the text in it? Uh, y'all doing it? Y'all well. doing it? Huh? I see it. How white am I? I, I, I how, how white I, am I? How white am I? And 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 I, I reason I actually okay, I re, I returned back to that print of two thousand and two thousand and two because. And I said, how can, how can I have this, this visual dialogue? Now, I'm an abstract artist for the most part, even though I do some figurative work. And I, because I believe, and in, in Al Lovin once said that the direct route to the intellect is abstraction. If you're going to present a paper at a conference, they ask you to submit a what? An abstract. They want you to get directly to the point. And that's why I use abstract, because I want to get directly to the point. And so here is I cloudy. I put it sometimes I cloud I cloud it out because that's a cloudy statement for the person saying it to themselves or saying it to someone else. Do we really want to? Do we really? Can, are we brave enough? Can we handle the pain of, of 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 dealing with a conversation that says, "How white are you?" You know, and it's, and it becomes it becomes a very engaging uh, uh, experience. I, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I had, was in a conversation with a colleague at the university one time, and I was explaining to this particular individual about the fact that we, they had to vote for African Americans to because uh, the voting right. They had to vote every so many years to make sure that we had the right to vote. And I asked, I said, "Well, you think they should need? Did they, they need to still do that? Meaning, why do they need to uh, need to do that now? Why can't we just have the right to vote?" Well. It's changed. I heard that it has changed since then. They have now. They don't have to, the, the Congress don't have to come together and vote on it you know, anymore. But I think they had to vote on it every 25 years. So I, when I in the process of trying to have this conversation, the person got upset. I don't want to talk about anything that deals with the issues of 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 of, 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 of black people and, and white people. It was really, I mean, just it was tense. I like wow. I said, well, I apologize. Excuse me, and I walked away. And what and what I, what I realized that there was a degree of cloudiness, this white cloud that that, that covers up the the, uh, the statements or the questions or the issues that we want to confront ourselves with. I even had a similar discussion with an individual who was African American, and I made reference to how they talked about the that uh, about black students who were not uh, was the incompetent and, and had. They, 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 most of them, a lot of them have low grade point average, this, that, and that. I said, whoa, slow down. And it's, and, and then we had that conversation because I was trying to get them to pay attention to a particular student who I thought had exceptional experience, meaning he came from a school that didn't have resources, but the work that he was producing was unbelievable. Say, so how can someone who could produce work under those conditions not be recognized and be supported? He didn't get the support I, that I tried to get to. to uh, he did not get the support that I thought he deserved. But he wind up receive, at the, He finished up the program and received one of the most outstanding awards in our program, which is the Ricky Zebo Award, which is a fifteen thousand dollar award trust fund and so forth that he's shared. And my point is, is because of the stereotype and the language of racism, sometimes cloud people's view of exactly what's going on, and they don't really see the real beautiful colors and forms that exist in this world. Here I, I produced another one. And 
this one clearly says, I'm not a racist. Another is kind of clouded. I'm not a racist. And what's interesting is that I've heard that I don't know how many times where we get into a conversation, person I'm not a racist. And in that and and while we was in a and in that conversation, in a group conversation, they had said made so many racist statements and made so many uh, gestures that came out of the, the statements that they didn't even realize they were doing it. And what's interesting, I, 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 what's interesting is that one person came back and said, "Oh, you know that uh, sometimes people say things they don't mean to say, and they come out, they didn't come out like they should." And you know, and sometimes when you associate with certain people, you know, you pick up some things, and you know, and they were trying to explain it. And what I realized is that a person genuinely feels that they're not a racist, but they're a product. They're a product of the institution of institution of racism, racism, and as a result, actually supporting a racist system without without even fully understanding that they're doing this. Because everyone who in, who engage in in who makes it, make those type of statements don't necessarily have to be a, a white supremacists. They are just individuals who have somehow become indoctrinated. I'll give you another example. When I was a kid, I was highly encouraged and influenced by James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart. I had to give me some of those hats. I had to give me some of those suits. I was just a teenager. I had to get me a gun. I'm on top of the world, mom. And as a result, I was being influenced by television, by those images. And the more I thought of it, when I got older and thought about it, I said, oh God, that's embarrassing. You know, it, you know some of the things that, that I was responding to was embarrassment and, 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 when I, and when I look back upon it. And so he, all of us can be influenced. So I'm not a racist, but it's still, it's a cloudy discussion. It's not really clear. And I also want to make emphasis on the idea of uh, the emphasis on uh, the is, racist. And the is is denoting a person who practice or is concerned with something or concerned with principles and doctrines associated with philosophy. And so th that's why I have it in orange. I have it, I have it separated in an orange because I'm, what I'm talking about is uh, principles and systems and documents. So when we look at the language, the language is allowing us to be able to know that we're not talking about skin color. We're not talking about, we're talking about human beings who, who's intellectually has been uh, uh, influenced to think in a given a certain way. The next piece, anti-racism. And after, what I find interesting about anti-racism when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, the more I got into that particular term, you know who I thought about? Elijah Lovejoy. If anybody uh, remember uh, uh, the, a senator, former senator, Paul Simon, may he rest in peace, wrote a book about Elijah Lovejoy, which I had an opportunity to read. And it was about a printmaker who wouldn't stop printing abolitionist material. He was an abolitionist. And when he refused to uh, stop doing it, they destroyed his pr uh, his, uh, his, press, his press and his and his and his company. He got another press, got everything fixed. He continued to do it. They eventually took his press and threw it into the river. He went and got another uh, press and continued work. Last time they tied him to the press and threw him in the river. Mind you, this is a white man who was willing to sacrifice his life for black people for African Americans, a Negro at the time. He didn't have to, he could easily just had it, went on with his life and, 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 and engage in what you call white privilege, but he didn't. And so as it, it was, and, and it was interesting when we had, we see artists like, uh, 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 if I may, Mike Ferris, who's willing to take, to have a conversation about these particular issues in a particular format that, can cost him his life. And we're talking about contemporary. So this whole idea of the white abolitionists, there's a, there's a lot of stories about how we was helped on Underground Railroad. So this idea of anti-racism, I, I feel is strongly connected to that historical reality of fighting against white supremacy. 
Frederick Douglass, and maybe think of him. Frederick Douglass was a fugitive. What crime did he commit to be a fugitive? Think about it. And so as a result of him challenging this system, this system of, uh, of slavery, and, and, and not only did he get his freedom, but he also learned how to read and write, wrote literature, did lectures. He actually challenged the system. He worked with, he was a black abolitionist and they worked together. They even argued together. That was even, that Frederick Douglass and the black abolitionists with William Garrison, who was a white abolitionist and their leader, got into a conversation one time about gathering the uh, uh, white abolitionists, gathering all their money, some resources, and they're gonna put Afri uh, send Africans back to um, uh, to Africa. Frederick Douglass said, "Well, wait a minute, where y'all from?" And they went to talking about places in America. They said, "No, no, no, where your where your parents and where y'all originally come from?" He said, "You know, different parts of Europe." And and he said, "Well, when we take that money and we give y'all some money, we send y'all going back to Europe." And they said, "Well, we're appalled by such a suggestion." And he said, well, how do you think we should feel when mm -hmm. we are several generations removed from, from, our, from, from, from that continent? And so this idea of the abolition movement and historical re reality, I felt was well connected to this idea of anti-racism that Eberin uh, uh, Kendi, uh, Kendi uh, talks about in his book. And so uh, then again, I use ism, that ism at the end, and ism being de uh, denoting an action or a quality or a system or principles or ideology, ideological movement and, a, and the basis for prejudice and discrimination or pathological um, condition, a pathological condition like alcoholism. You talk about alcoholism, racism, anything that's dealing with that type of uh, reality. So that's why I separate ism and is from the word race to be able to get to be able to understand that we're not talk we're talking about systems that we can actually change. And in closing, in closing, I like to simply say this: that uh, there was a, a, a leader by the name of Man Ward D. Muhammad, who may he rest in peace, had a, a lecture and he said that race, the language of racism, or the language of race, as we know it in America is a freak language. And that if it disappears, we will not be harmed by it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Can we give Najar and all of these wonderful artists um, a, applause, love? This is just, this has just been an amazing, amazing, show. I'm of course looking forward to the day where we can be together for live shows again. Um, um, thank you, our professor, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Taylor, um, we can open it up now, I guess, for questions for Najara. Any questions, um, any comments? Yes. Um, the how white are you? I don't know. I was just, maybe I was just missing something. I don't really understand that concept. When you said, when you said, even if someone of a different race does something, you would still, it would still be referenced as white supremacy. So could you like kind of explain that further? Because I kind of didn't. Okay. What, ha what happens is, is that when individuals who says that, um, who may be African American, or mm -hmm. or of any other nationality, if they embrace the idea of something that's associated with white supremacy as being elevated, for instance, if they saying, "Girl, you got like the, the, the sand talk about the hair," that if you don't have hair, don't look straight straight like a white person's hair, then you, it's white supremacy, and so they identify with that. Even though black women don't even associate it with the idea of being trying to be like a white woman, but there, there have been conversations, and if I'm, and I've seen and heard these type of conversations about how yeah. I look. The another thing is the idea of the bleaching skins, uh, getting a, a, a cosmetic surgery to, to okay. make, and so when those things, when they, you know, and they, we're not the African American is not the only one who does that. I'm simply saying that people of other ethnic groups have uh, do, does it as well. 
Michael Jackson is not by itself. Mm. Okay. I, I understand better now. Thank you. You're welcome. Robert, did you have a comment or a question? It looked like you wanted to say something. Un could you unmute your mic, please? No, I didn't have a question. I was just trying to listen intently. Yeah, good presentation, brother. Thank you, thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be involved in this type of dialogue. You see, I was kind of excited. So forgive me. I'm at, I, I get excited when I, if I had went to the hospital and while I was in the hospital, the nurse came in and checked my blood pressure and said, your blood pressure was okay. Why it's so high? And well, I said, these artists came in, we've been talking about art. She said, well, y'all can't talk about art and they got to leave. <laughs> <laughs> that is a true story. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. So I, I get, I, but I'm really passionate about the idea well, of a visual dialogue and visual language. I mean, you know, you can, I mean, we could talk about French, you know, French is very romantic, but I think art, the language of art is even more sexy and more romantic. There you go, there you go. Well, I have learned so much tonight. Um, thank you, Desand, for um, discussing a, a very interesting topic and, and letting us know about the legislation. Mm, that was deep. Thank you. And, yeah. the reactions and our hair that was um, might just um, the critical race theory, the critical enlightenment theory. You're you've challenged me to go do some more reading and research. Yeah. Robert, just your work, your investigation of blues, you know, as our art form and how it documents our history and how really it was the art form that that really um, started all of the other in the uniquely American art form that it is. And then of course, Professor Musawir, I, I, there's a lot to chew on with how you just described white supremacy. I've never thought of it in those terms. So again, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna give Dr. Taylor um, the floor if he has any final wrap up comments and questions. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the evening uh, in listening to different perspectives about race and racism. Um, and I wonder if the if there's not more to do as it relates to bringing art into discussion. And um, we talk about healing. We, we, we identified the problem, I think, a lot tonight, but I didn't hear, uh, I think, what I would consider a lot of solutions to move forward. How do we grow together? The art, the art again, it, it, it really kind of focused on the problem and you know and part of me you know the intellectual part of me wants to look back in history and say okay what happened to the egyptians and the jews back in the day uh, was their brown critical race theory and how did they work to solve those problems of course you know they left and that kind of stuff so i, I would love to be able to to take this a step further. I would love for people to kind of let us know what they would like to see moving forward in the future um, and see if we can really kind of host some 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 real conversations about what we can do to uh, make this a better better place. So I would I would encourage I would encourage uh, to read the, the books that I presented. I think that these book books are about solutions and, and healing processes. I, I could I, if, I, if I had to turn to getting into them deeper that would have took another maybe an hour or two, sure. you know, actually a semester of teaching. <laughs> and so, uh, but I, I, I understand what you're saying. And uh, I felt, I, I do feel that, uh, that understanding the language, getting people to understand the language to have that conversation is a healing process. What we're doing now is part of the healing process. And I think that I just, I just really feel that the healing process is painful, and it takes and it's, it's so many. It's, it has so many levels. That just, that just because we went through the, the uh, foundation of it right now doesn't mean that we're not cure, trying to make making a cure. Like when you're in the hospital, they give you a little medicine. If you stay there longer, they give you a little more, and you take until they get you to a point of health good, that you're healthy. And that's the way I'm looking at it. And, I, and I'm, I'm saying it because I, I agree with you. And, and, and agree with you in terms of that we really need to expand this conversation and get even more deep in terms of the uh, the resolutions 
and, 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 and successful outcomes of, of healing. But healing is painful, as Dick Gregory said. So, Dr. Taylor, that's, uh, but I definitely feel you, man. Well, you know, most of, uh, most of racism that affect me and the grievances I have uh, from institutional racism. Um, yeah, I can deal with a, a, an individual of a different race uh, not wanting to be with me and not understanding me, but institutional racism is holding me back. Sister. I can hold my ancestors back and hopefully it won't hold my, my children back. So I think it's, we got to be careful that we don't get into the conversation too deeply about personal uh, uh, racism. You know, this person is racist, that person is racist. Right. But it's the system that has to be dismantled and rebuilt uh, for true justice and equality to exist. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent point. And again, you know, Healing Illinois has, has been such an amazing project on so many levels, but here, how do we keep it continued? The grant is over June the 30th. Um, the seed money that they gave us to put these, and they basically, they, died, they gave us a very broad canvas and this really fit with Legacy's mission, which is to bring art, to promote art, in underserved communities. And I've been blessed to work with these artists. So when we put out the call for artists and they responded, it was like, like this is what we back together. They've actually done a show. Well, the Sam, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember if you were part of that, but there was a show at Shawnee Community College that Mike and I co-curated. I believe it was the first time you had had that many African-American artists on campus. Najar has been um, right. really involved, but we brought other artists and we bust in kids from Carol, Meridian, um, Century. <coughs> I, think, I think quite a few schools. For Lynn, yes, I was there. I from kids, you know, first of all, were you there to say and thank yeah. you? Yes. So um, charge it to the head, not the heart. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, and I still have people run into me. First of all, they were amazed because they didn't know Black folks could do, do art, make a living at it. Mm -hmm. And it was just it was just a wonderful experience. So the the educational process, maybe if we you can use your influence, Dr. Taylor, and maybe let's do this show and And bring these to school. Maybe one step to keep the conversation going. I, and to responding to Dr. Taylor's request for so for suggestions, uh, I just I, I think that he I think we should be doing maybe do have workshops that focus on the healing along with the exhibitions or with the artwork mm -hmm. that brings in other professionals that, that identify that identifies with the uh, the, the uh, these types of issues either politically. Uh, uh, psych psychologically, so in terms of the psyche, and so forth and so on. I think I, I, I think that would help really start getting to leaning more, to looking at the uh, healing process, and and being able to get a little more out of what we're, we're doing here. Well, we are open to ideas and suggestions. We've posted a five minute survey that you can fill out and let us know what you thought about tonight's event and give us any ideas. I'll be sure and share whatever I um, gather with Dr. Taylor and all of the thought leaders. We, we've had Judge Tyler Edmonds. We've had Senator Dale Fowler. We had Steve Heisner, who is a corporate executive with Dippin' Dots. So really reaching to people that I frankly don't collaborate as enough with on a daily basis. And it's really brought some very powerful insights on both of our parts. Um, last, lastly, just one more plug. Next week is our final Healing Illinois event for the Artist Collective. Jazz in June, my co-facilitator is gonna be the mayor of Cesar, Illinois, um, the Honorable Jay Jason Ashmore. 
The performers will be John Winings, who's been a music educator in our community for many years and is a wonderful musician and a pastor. Um, and he collaborated with Doreen Ketchens, who is a um, internationally known clarinetist from New Orleans. So New Orleans type jazz. Mm -hmm. So we will, we're excited about that. I hope you guys can be with us again, 7 p.m. Um, so it'll be earlier. We just yeah, yeah. missed back because we were simulcasting, but we'll be back to seven o'clock um, next week for our final one. Dr. Taylor, thank you so very much again for being culturally courageous, for really not knowing what to expect. Just here's Lynn dragging me down another road, but thank you for trusting me that I knew you would be the perfect co-facilitator for this event. And I knew that you are a leader that gets it and a leader that really wants to be and will be a change in our community. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Lynn, for having me. This was an awesome experience and I'm really glad to meet all of you all virtually. It'll be, a, a, it'll be a, a nice day when we can meet face to face. Congratulations again. Thank you. All right. And with that, is there anything else? Any Anybody want to announce anything or say anything before we say good night? I have um, a question. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay. So I was just wondering, how would I know about these meetings um, outside of getting in touch with my dad, do you guys post on a Facebook group? Do you send out an email, a text? Like, how do you guys get in touch with people? That's a great question. And, and I, um, we're constantly working at doing better, but Legacy Training Inc. has a website. We also have a Facebook, we're streaming live on the Facebook page. I also <laughs> post it on my personal page. Um, and I think everybody, well, most of you here, if you do Facebook, we're Facebook friends. Um, but young young people like you, we really need to get, learn, yeah. get the word out. And that's why I was asking so I could see how, you know, to get, you know, people of all age um, groups involved, you know. Because we actually did a hip hop one last week. Um, to try to enjoy. And these will be posted on our YouTube channel. So they'll be archived um, that people can go back and watch, but encourage them. And even, you know, back to the classrooms or church groups or any kind of communities of faith, whatever group you have, you can actually use these and play them and keep the conversation going, you know? Um, right. So, but yes, and if you have any ideas, Malika, if you'd like to volunteer for Legacy, we would Absolutely. love to. I'll get a hold of you through your dad and, and welcome to the family. Okay, thank you. And happy early Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to my dad. I love you. I love you too. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Father's Day Najar. Yeah. He's the best. He's the best. <laughs> thank you. Happy Father's Day to, my, uh, to all of y'all as well. And thanks, Malika, for continuing to uh, engage yourself into intellectual pursuits. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, nothing further. I will let you enjoy your evening. We are right on time. So thank you again. I so appreciate you so much. And if Ami and I could be of any service, we are at your disposal. So I'll be back in touch for our final wrap-up session at the end in early July, if you can come back and we will be discussing next steps and how we can continue our collaborations. Lynn, may, Lynn, thank you so much. May you be blessed with so much blessings that uh, you can handle it all of it. So thank you for the work you're not only doing for this, but all the work you have done to bring us to this point. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for including us. Thank you, yes, thank you, Lynn. Thanks for including me. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. God bless. God bless.